Good morning. Welcome to Cornerstone Baptist. Love seeing you encourage each other. Conversations like this. So we finally get back to the Gospel of Luke after several months away from it. We're towards the end of Luke chapter 12 this morning. Forty years ago, when I worked in the in the garage, there were several of the tire changers who wouldn't show up to work on Saturday morning. Friday was payday, so Friday was also play day, and Saturday morning a few of the guys just were in no shape to come into work. But they didn't care, they had enough money for the weekend, so they just spent it. Who cares about next week? In the 40 years since then, I found that a lot of people live this way, we're not planning ahead two weeks for the rent that's due or the car insurance that has to be paid. They have money in their pockets, so they just go and spend it. In Luke 12, Jesus tells us not to worry about tomorrow, but he doesn't tell us to ignore it. In fact, in our passage this morning, he says to be ready for tomorrow because Jesus is coming back when we least expect it. So be ready. We have to give an account to him. We have to look him in the eye and say, here is what I did and why I did it. Are we ready? And that is the question that Jesus is asking us to be prepared to answer in Luke 12 this morning. So we'll get to that in a few minutes. But let's sing together number 35 in your hymnals. Number 35. <clears throat> Worship the Lord. Let's stand as we sing this.
from tomorrow, we can live for you today. Pray for those who are struggling in their lives and some decisions to make and health needs and other needs. I pray for Kavanaugh's or their vehicles and pray for Janie and her upcoming move and for Gary and his breathing struggles. And I pray for job um, opportunities and I pray for opportunities of sharing the gospel with family and friends and relatives and neighbors and workmates. I pray that you would give open doors and that you would give us wisdom to know what to say and then boldness to say it when those opportunities come. Father, I pray for our individual lives to be aimed directly at you not to be distracted, not to be um, just chasing other things other than Jesus and his righteousness. I pray that as we consider this morning our future life with you and having to answer to you, I pray that we'd be ready. I pray that we'd be ready constantly for Christ's return. I pray for those who can't be here, that you would encourage them. I pray for contact that we have with them, that that would be a, a, a helpful thing and not discouraging to them. Guide us as we read your word and study it this morning and then apply it to our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. You, have to you, you may be seated, I'm sorry. Wow. This is one of those mornings. So. Thank you for praying this past few weeks, um, culminating with being away this week with a conference in New York. Those poor people down in New York, all of the gospel-shaped outreach, all 36 kind of parallel studies, you know, each week we had four different parallel things we were studying. They got it all in six sessions. And we boiled it down and and try to give it in a way that would be helpful to them. And, and I pray that we were able to encourage them. Interesting observing other churches. And when you go away, when you're on vacation or something, I encourage you, I urge you, I beg you to attend church with God's people. Um, make it important. Make it important here and then make it important when you go away. And you will, you will observe some things. And that church was about the size of ours. And 
I observed that there were two different churches within the same building. There was the church that claimed to be who they, who they claimed to be, and then there was another totally separate circle assembly of people who were there trying to make the church into something that it had never claimed to be, and it wasn't. Most of them were transfers in from another church or churches, and they were unwilling to take on the identity of the church there, but they were trying to change the church to be what they wanted it to be. Now, are there changes that have to happen within a church? Often, yes, there are. We all must follow Christ. But sometimes what happens is we look at a church constitution and the way the church was designed from the very beginning to, to attempt to live out the principles of God's word. And then we go into that church and we say, well, I don't like this. I don't agree with this, so I'm going to try to change it. Um, th th that is kind of a human nature type of thing that we observe. And that, it's just something that you could pray for that church in New York about. So we think about a few announcements coming up. Today is Vacation Bible School meeting. Uh, it is the end of April, which means that Vacation Bible School is only two months away. It, it's coming. It's coming quickly. So we'll have to just hammer out a few details this morning, uh, or this noon, about how things are going and then maybe what we need to do from here. There is still room at the Shepherd, at the Striving for the Mastery Conference in North Conway. Uh, if you would like to go, I think we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, eight of us going uh, that I know of so far. But if you're interested, you can see me or Randy, that they have been taking care of some of the rest of you. I think that's the announcement for this morning. Um, our missionaries today are Joe and Donna Childers. They are in Grenville, Grenada. Um, starting a church there, establishing a church there, but what they're aiming to do is, is make that church the hub for a Bible Institute. They have a Christian school and make it the hub for a kind of a leapfrog type of, of evangelism and church planting throughout the Southern Caribbean. So pray for the Childers. A sister church is up in West Stewartstown, New Hampshire, uh, literally a stone's throw from the border and they are serving the Lord to the best of their ability up there and appreciate their fellowship in the gospel. Ushers, come please and we we'll receive the offering. Let's pray. Father, I pray for Joe and Donna as they are down in Grenada. I pray as they worship right at this moment, you would help your word to be clear I pray that hearts would be soft and would respond to you in the Holy Spirit's work. I pray for your provision for their needs. I pray for their health as each one struggles with different areas. I pray that they'd be wise, but that you would also give them wisdom in how to care for those needs. Thank you for Hope Baptist up in West Stewartstown. I pray as they worship you this morning that they too would be listening to your word carefully and then seeking ways to apply it through your help. Thank you for the privilege we have of giving towards your work, and we ask for your blessing on this offering. In Jesus' name, amen.
scripture reading today is in the Gospel of Luke, and we will be starting in verse 35. Joe, if you could come, please, and read for us. Good morning. It's been a little while. Join you if you would. Turn to the book of Luke. Chapter 12, and I'll be reading verses 35 through 48, if you'd like to follow along. Let your loins be girt about, and your lights burning, and yet yourselves like unto men that wait for their Lord, when he will return from the wedding, that when he cometh and knocketh, they may open unto him immediately. Blessed are those servants whom the Lord, when he cometh, shall find watching. Verily I say unto you, that he shall gird himself, and make them to sit down to me, and will come forth and serve them. And if he shall come in the second watch, or come in the third watch, and find them so, blessed are those servants. And this know, that if the goodman of the house had known what hour the thief would come, he would have watched, and not have suffered his house to be broken through. But be ye therefore ready also, for the Son of Man cometh at an hour, when ye think not. When Peter had said unto him, Lord, speakest thou this parable unto us, or even to all? And the Lord said, Who then is that faithful and wise servant, steward, whom his Lord shall make ruler over his household, to give them their portion of meat in due season? Blessed is that servant whom his Lord, when he cometh, shall find so doing. Of a truth I say unto you, that he will make him ruler over all that he hath. But, and if that servant say in his heart, My Lord delayeth his coming, and shall begin to beat the men servants and maidens, and to eat and drink, and to be drunken, the Lord of that servant will come in a day when he looketh not for him, and at an hour when he is not aware, and will cut him in sunder, and will appoint him his portion with the unbelievers. And that servant, which knew his Lord's will, and prepared not himself, neither did according to his will, shall be beaten with many stripes. But he that knew not, and did commit things worthy of stripes, shall be beaten with few stripes. For unto whomsoever much is given, to him shall be much required. And to whom men have committed much, of him they will ask the more. May the Lord add blessing to the reading of his word. Thank you. Uh, one clarification in your bulletin. Next week's passage is the following passage, starting in verse 49. Pastor's editing did not pick that up when I was printing the bulletins. So next week will be the next few verses. I'd like to take our hymnals and look at our church covenant in the very beginning, the very front cover of our hymnals. Sometimes pastor forgets to read this at the Lord's table, and I think it's very helpful to us to remind ourselves the promises that we've made to each other. Let's read it in unison. Having been led by the Spirit of God to receive the Lord Jesus Christ as our Savior, and on the profession of our faith, having been baptized in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, we do now, in the presence of God, the holy angels, in this assembly, most solemnly and joyfully enter into covenant with one another as one body in Christ, in obedience to the command of God and in his strength. We promise that we will pray for one another in our prayers, watching over one another in brotherly love, counseling one another in the spirit of love, aiding one another in sickness and distress. We further agree by the aid of the Holy Spirit 
to walk together in Christian love, striving together for the advancement of this church in knowledge, holiness, and comfort, promoting its prosperity and spirituality, sustaining its worship, ordinances, discipline, and doctrine, giving its sacred preeminence over all institutions of human origin, contributing cheerfully and regularly to the support of the ministry, the expenses of the church, the relief of the poor, and the spread of the gospel throughout all nations. We further covenant to maintain family and secret devotions, to religiously educate our children, seek the salvation of our family and acquaintances, live cautiously in this present world, being just in our dealing, faithful in our obligations, exemplary in our deportment, avoiding all tattling, backbiting, gossip, and excessive anger, abstaining from anything that could cause our brother to stumble or bring dishonor upon the cause of Christ. We will strive to grow in grace and knowledge of our Lord, and amidst evil and good report, we will humbly and earnestly seek to live unto the honor and glory of him who loved us and gave himself for us. We moreover agree that when we remove from this place, we will as soon as possible unite with some other church where we can carry out the spirit of this covenant and the principles of God's word. Sobering, sobering promises that we make, but I trust it's helpful to you as it is to me to review them. We as leaders met a week, almost two weeks ago, and one of the things that we have been talking about is, is that we have been wrong as leaders. And the area that we've been wrong in is in, in our consistent application of what we say we believe as a church. And it relates to, to allowing people to have teaching or public impactful influence when being non-members. And why is that important? Well, it's important because if you say we don't agree with this church, so we're not going to become members, but then if we allow you to then have a public influence, then, then how does the church family know that you are influencing publicly towards what the church believes, even though you say you don't believe what the church believes. So we were wrong and we ask your forgiveness in allowing broad involvement in those ways. Now, we want to clarify as leaders too, that we love to see people serving. We love to see believers serving. Um, but we want to make clear what our maybe non-public or less influential areas of service that non-members can be involved in or what is teaching or very publicly influential and, and one would be non-members and one would be members uh, mainly because of if you say you do not believe what the church believes why would the church as a whole trust you to then teach what the church believes? I, I, I hope that makes sense to us. I, I know it's very fuzzy. Every church draws lines differently. Every church does. Every church is responsible before God to make wise decisions. This afternoon, the one Bible study that I will be leading, there will be another Bible study going at the same time that uh, small groups but the one I will be leading is on our freedom of conscience. We truly believe that here. We, we believe that every church is responsible before God to hammer out as an assembly what they believe God teaches in his word and how they want us to be practicing it. And then each individual Christian has the responsibility before God 
to apply God's word in their own lives and then to join themselves to a church in which they can agree. We're not forced to join a church, but we are encouraged by God to join the church of that best matches our belief systems. Um, if a church does not match our belief systems, then we are, have freedom of conscience and responsibility before God to find one that does. And as we just read, we, when we remove from this place, we will as soon as possible unite with some other church where we can carry out the spirit of this covenant and the principles of God's word. Um, we welcome everyone here, but there are different levels of involvement that Cornerstone Baptist allows based on membership or not. And again, we, we ask your forgiveness for not making that clear um, in the past. And then we will say, it may not be clear in the future because there's, every church draws the lines in different places. We are trying to be consistent, um, but that doesn't always happen effectively. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for putting up with us. Um, and thank you for being committed to the Lord and desiring to chase after him. We don't think anybody here, it's possible there are, but we don't think anybody here is chasing after something else. You know, that's not what we're saying. But we're saying if we're going to be unified and moving together as a church, we must be united around what the church says it believes. Hope that clarifies. Let's take our hymnals again. 627. 627. What a day that will be. You can remain seated. What a day that will be. The things that we just don't understand exactly how it works, where we try to meet at the Word of God and, and hammer things out. I'm so glad that God knows and that God wants to communicate to us through His Word. But one day, I think things will become clear to us. So Luke chapter 12, Luke chapter 12. We should be ready for the Lord's return because when he comes, he will judge everyone. Every one of us will stand before God as our judge and he will either be judging us relating to whether we trusted Christ or not or if we have trusted Christ, we'll be judged on how faithful we were in following our Lord's instructions. The text 35 through 48 falls into two sections. 35 through 40 is being ready for his coming, and then 
The next section is that when the Lord comes, he will judge everyone according to what they have done with what they have been given. Now, who is Jesus speaking to directly here? If you look in verse 1, Jesus is talking to this innumerable multitude. In verse 13, one of the company said to him, and Jesus is responding to him, yes, most likely in the hearing of everyone else, but Jesus is directing his remarks to that one person. Verse 22, he speaks to the disciples. And then in verse 54, we will come to this next week where he said also to the, to the people, to the crowds. So right here, 22 through 53 are directed towards his disciples, his followers. How did disciples act? Where should disciples focus? What should disciples be looking to accomplish? What should disciples be expecting in the future? And all of those are covered here as it relates to disciples in verses 35 through 40. So Peter then in 41 says, is this for us or for everybody? And Jesus doesn't really specifically answer him, but it seems that others possibly are listening in, but he's answering Peter directly. So in the main point in 35 through 40 is the readiness for the Lord's return. We should be ready for the Lord to return. And then we have these four word pictures that help us to understand what Jesus expects of us. Let your loins be girded. Uh, be dressed for action, um, some translations put it. And we can picture, you know, the skirts that they would wear, and they would tuck them up in their belt and be ready to run. Well, here Jesus is saying, keep your robes tucked up so you can run at a moment's notice. Um, maybe in today's terminology, um, be ready for action constantly. Um, get out of your pajamas, get into your work clothes. Uh, don't be like those at Walmart, okay, that go to Walmart in their pajamas. Um, be ready. Be ready for work. But then keep your lamps burning. Picture um, trying to get your oil lamp going with no matches. Um, you're, you're trying to, to take the, the coals and, and get the oil-soaked um, wick kind of started. And, and it might take you a while to get it going. So it would be far easier if you just kept the, the wick trimmed and kept some oil in the lamp so that at the moment's notice when, when this, the master came and knocked on the door, you had a light instantly. We get so spoiled with a light switch, but keep your lights burning. Uh, number three in verses 36 through 38, the picture is be waiting for your master to come home after the wedding feast. Now this is more difficult. How long does a wedding feast last? It could be a few days, could be four or five days, could be a week. We don't know when he's coming back. So be ready. Will it be today? Will it be tomorrow? Will it be this afternoon? Will it be at midnight tonight? Will it be the third watch of the night, like three or four in the morning? We don't know. So be ready. So that's the third word picture. And then the fourth word picture is verse 39. This we know that if the goodman of the house had known what hour the thief would have come, he would have watched and not suffered his house to be broken into. So the fourth word picture is this thief breaking into the house. If you have an appointment that the thief has made, I'm gonna be there at 3.30 in the morning on Tuesday this week, you'd be up and waiting. You'd have the baseball bat or, or whatever. Nathan left me some nice bird shot, uh, 12 gauge bird shot. We'd be ready. We'd be up, we'd be waiting. But if you 
are kind of, eh, who cares? You wouldn't be up and waiting. But Jesus, 35 through 40, uh, look, you need to be ready. So that's the application in verse 40. Be therefore ready, for the Son of Man comes at an hour when you think not. So that is the application, is to be ready. There are excuses people use. Look, it's been 2,000 years. He hasn't come yet. Eh, I've got time. I've got a life to live, you know. I've got blueberries to trim this afternoon, peach tree to, to prune, animals to feed, family picnic to go to. Obviously, Jesus isn't coming if he hasn't come yet. Now, even 2,000 years ago, people were living as if it were payday and they weren't planning for the next day. They did it in Jesus' day. And then Peter, in 2 Peter 3, uses this very similar language of verse 39. The day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. So, so Peter uses that certain terminology in which the heavens will pass away with a roar, the elements will be destroyed with intense heat. By the way, this passage also applies, 2 Peter 3, applies to next week's passage. Well, there's fire coming. I came to light a fire. Some of us are pyromaniacs, enjoy playing with fire. Jesus said, I came to light a fire. And we'll figure out what that means next week. But the earth and its works will be burned up. Everything that you've poured your life into, if it only had to do with the earth and its works, it will be burned up and gone. So is what I am spending my time on, my energy on, is it going to last or not? Since all these things are going to be destroyed in this way, what sort of people ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness? Looking for and hastening to the coming of the day of God. Very parallel passage to this passage. So verse 41, Peter says, Lord, are you speaking this parable to us or to everybody? I don't think Peter really understood what Jesus was talking about fully. But yet later, as he's speaking under the inspiration of the Holy Ghost in 2 Peter, I believe he understood far better what Jesus was talking about here. Be ready, because Jesus is coming back when you don't expect it. There is an error. Peter mentioned the error uh, that some say he's already returned. I'm not going to spend a lot of time here, but there are some today who say that Christ has already returned. There are no rapture, no tribulation, no trumpet judgments, no seal judgments, no bowl judgments, no millennium on this earth, no Armageddon. It's already passed. The, the extremists say this happened in 70 A.D., when Titus destroyed Jerusalem. It was, it was an apocalyptic time in AD 70. We're not denying that. Um, the big word, the word of the day, you might say is preterism. A preterist is somebody who lives in the past. So a preterist is, is looking backwards at AD 70 and saying that this was fulfilled then. Several things have, have to happen in order for that to be true. Um, they have to move the writing of the book of Revelation from in the mid-90s A.D. to sometime before this, saying these were all prophesying um, A.D. 70 and Jerusalem being destroyed. Now, there are some preterists who look for a dual fulfillment, saying many of these prophecies were fulfilled in A.D. 70, some maybe at some point in the future. But Jesus says to us, be ready, for the Son of Man comes at an hour when you think not. Peter, 2 Peter 3, says, be ready, because the day of the Lord comes like a thief in the night. So we are still looking forward. We're not in our spiritual pajamas. We're keeping our lamps trimmed spiritually. We're not becoming dull. We're not letting our 
oil run out, so to speak. We're, we're keeping our relationship with God up to date. We're waiting day and night, expecting him. We're guarding our spiritual lives. We're not allowing sin to creep in. We're not making excuses for sin creeping in. We're looking for Jesus to return. So how do we be ready? How can we be ready? So again, look at the text, verse 37, 38. Um, servants. Servants have a master. Verse 43, blessed is that servant whom his master, his Lord, will find watching. Serve Jesus as your master. It is so easy to be driven by our own desires. It is so easy to be driven by somebody else's desires, somebody else's demands. Sometimes it's a spouse, sometimes it's a child, sometimes it's a parent, sometimes it's a boss. What are we driven by? Well, be driven by Jesus as our master. 37, 38, 37, see the first word there, blessed or happy are those servants. Um, 38, the end of the verse, blessed or happy are those servants. And then in verse 43, blessed or happy is that servant whom his Lord finds so doing. Servants don't have a life of their own. They serve their master. They stay up all night if necessary. Nathan called last evening, and a young child over in North Conway that we had prayed for since before she was born, who had spinal bifida and many other problems, um, had a very serious seizure in the middle of the night, Friday night. So Nathan got the call, 12.30 in the morning. Is this my alarm? I gotta get going. No, not my alarm. What is it? And, and I think we've all experienced that. But then to be able to jump out of bed and, and to go and to serve at that time of day, no matter what the time of day is. 1 Corinthians 6, I'm not my own. I've been bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in my body and my spirit, which are God's. Is that how I see my life? Owned by God, I'm serving him. Servants don't just sit on the front porch waiting. Oh, master's coming back sometime. They actively work for their master. And we'll be getting into that here in the next few verses as well. It becomes even more obvious um, down 42 through 48. But for right here, verse 37, they are on the alert. Verse 39, we know that Satan tries to steal our spiritual energy. Are we staying alert? We're familiar with the way our flesh kind of attacks our spiritual lives. We're aware of how the world around us influences us away from Christ. Be alert. And then verse 40, we know that the King of Kings is coming. Are we ready? Is our house in order? So I, I put in your notes the cat illustration. Uh, I'll, I'll make it short. Every day, 3.30 in the afternoon, I don't know how animals have a time clock that they punch. But 3.30, the cat is at the door waiting for his mistress to come home. Um, he may not be at the front door, but he's looking out the front window. And I'll be in my office, and I will know Betsy come, has come home, not because of hearing the car drive in, but because I hear the cat jump off the windowsill and go run into the front door. Isn't that interesting? Is that how we see Christ's return? Are we waiting and watching and ready? For him, he's coming. Well, then Peter asks the question, is this just for us, the 12, or is it for more people than this? Again, Jesus doesn't answer directly, but look at the end of verse 48, the middle. 
unto whomsoever much is given, of him shall much be required. To whom men have committed much, of him they will ask the more. I think Jesus' application for Peter is this. Peter, you have been able to be with me constantly for several years. So yes, you have a higher responsibility to me than somebody who has only just heard of me. Of whom much is given, of him shall much be required. Many of us have grown up in church. We're responsible. Some of us have been saved more recently. We are responsible for what we have been exposed to. Now, I'm just going to pause here and say, the solution to this isn't, well, I'm just going to stay home and never open my Bible, and then I won't be responsible for anything. You know, there are people that think that way. So I, I, I need to say that. Um, we'll cover that this afternoon some, too. We are responsible before God with what God has given us, and we have the Word of God completed in our hands that we can understand and, and apply, so we are responsible. So the second main point, we, we had the readiness, now we have the result. The result of being ready is to work in light of the coming evaluation. In verses 35 through 40, being ready involved watching and waiting, and Verses 42 through 48, the result is working, watching, waiting, and working. So again, Jesus doesn't answer Peter directly, but he answers with a rhetorical question. It goes something like this. Um, what is a good manager? How do you evaluate a good manager? Verse 42, who then is a faithful and wise steward, whom his Lord will make ruler over his household to give them the portion of meat in due season. Maybe to put it another way, who gets the advancement at work, the promotion at work? What kind of employee gets that kind of promotion? Who is going to be promoted by his Lord? And notice in verse 42 the word steward. The steward is a manager. They have been given responsibilities. They've been given material goods and then instructions to carry out. And then in verse 43, 45, 46, 47, there's the word servant. Um, they're similar. They are different. Uh, a steward emphasizes the managing. The servant emphasizes the ownership by the master. So what is the responsibility of a servant, 42, 43, 44? It would be to manage well, to steward well what God has given you. So an illustration we can all understand is, look, just do a good job. Do a good job at what you are given to do. Who is this wise steward? Um, verse 43, blessed, happy is that servant, whom his Lord, when he comes, shall find doing, Doing what? Well, giving them, verse 42, their portion of meat in due season. What does that mean? Well, you've been assigned to take care of the family, which means having the meal ready when it's time, when it's meal time. You have, you have the lunch all cooked and ready to go and, and ready to serve when it's time in due season. Blessed, happy is the servant who his Lord finds doing this. Verse, um, again, back 37, blessed and happy are the ones who are intently watching for the master to come. Blessed, happy, verse 38, are those who are up all night waiting for their master. That's what they live for, day in, day, not, day out. And then verse 46, um, the Lord of the servant will come in a day when he looks not for him at an hour when he's not aware will cut him in, into and appoint him his portion with the unbelievers. Um, the servants that are doing what God wants them to do are the ones who are the happiest. Serve Jesus. How do we serve Jesus? 
by serving the people around us. Again, verse 42. Are you using your time, talent, materials to selfishly serve yourself or to serve the people around you? So that's a responsibility. What is the response? Response is that they are faithful and unselfishly serving and they are therefore happy and rewarded. Who are the happiest employees? The happiest employees are the ones who do their job well. Now, often in our world in 2024, that is flipped upside down. What if my boss would just make me happy, then I would do my job well. You, you see the difference? No, Jesus says, do your job well, and that is what makes you blessed, this, this sense of well-being. Verse 45, 46 gives the unjust servant, the selfish, abusive servant. If that servant say in his heart, my Lord delays his coming, will begin to beat the men servants, maidens, to eat and drink and be drunk, the Lord of that servant will come in a day when he looks not for him, at an hour when he's not aware, will cut him in two, will appoint him his portion with the unbelievers. He's punished. There's blessing and happiness for the obedient servant and then punishment for the unfaithful servant. Notice the two errors. Verse 45, he said to himself, I'll do what I want to for now. I don't need to worry about my master coming back yet. So he selfishly used people instead of serving them. You know, he, he starts to beat the people around him to get them to do what he wants rather than serving them. The best servants are servants, servants of all. But then what else? Verse 46, he thought he had plenty of time to clean up his life before the master appeared. But Jesus was returning when we least expected. Let's talk briefly about the end of verse 46, cutting in pieces and putting with unbelievers. You'll get several different viewpoints of this. Uh, one of the things that helps us is, is to think of this um, distinction or, or this, this truth about words. If you look um, at verse 42, it says, who is that faithful and wise steward, faithful. Just keep that word in mind. And then in the end of verse 46, the unbelievers, that is exactly the same word. Faithful and belief or faith are exactly the same word. We have to determine which it's leaning towards by, by looking at the context. Now, Put it this way, if you are trusting Christ, you're believing in him, and, and you're believing only in him and not trying to chase your own desires, you will be a faithful servant. So, so that is true. Um, but then as we try to sort this out, what is cutting in pieces and all of that and being put with unbelievers mean? On the one hand, um, we could just see this as a figure of speech. You get dressed, a good dressing down by the boss when he comes back and finds you unfaithfully serving. And you will be categorized with the unfaithful. You are an unfaithful servant. There are enough other parables that Jesus gives that we could take that interpretation in a very uh, easy way to say, you were a wise servant. You, I gave you this many talents and you were faithful in multiplying them, so you are faithful. And then I gave you a talent to do with and, and multiply it and you didn't, you were unfaithful. Um, so we could take this that way or we could take this as these people who are never really serving their master to begin with. They're never really believers. Which is it? Um, I don't know for sure. So I'm just humbly going to say I, I really don't know. Um, I don't think it is, speaking of 
cutting into bodily pieces, I, I think it is give, giving a good dressing down. And they are certainly not rewarded. They're certainly not praised for their lack of faithfulness to their master. So what is our application? We're, Jesus gives our application, verse 47, 48. That servant which knew his Lord's will and prepared not himself, neither did according to his will, shall be beaten with many stripes. In other words, it was clear. Um, here's the instructions. Do you understand? Yes, I understand. So the master goes away and the servant doesn't do it. He understood fully. He's accountable. But then in verse 48, but he that didn't know, but yet committed things worthy of stripes will be, will be beat, beaten with few stripes. In other words, he's still accountable. Well, I didn't see that speed limit sign. You're still accountable. God has given us his word that we are accountable to. But some have been given more opportunities to learn, more opportunities to be exposed to God's will. We do know God's will. And then we say something like this, someday I'll follow Christ, but I got bills to pay. I got, I got a boat out here I have to pay for. I got a new car. I just bought a camp up, up, upstate. I got to pay for. I'll start loving the church Jesus died for next week. This week I have a cookout to go to. I'll start loving my wife the way God expects the day she gets her act together. Um, I'll find ways to bless my kids when my own to-do list gets accomplished. I got things to do, you know. And yes, pastors here too to hear the truth proclaimed in church every Sunday and to ignore it the rest of the week, Jesus says, you are accountable. And there is serious accountability to it. So 45 years ago, I grabbed the truth of verse 48 as a guiding principle for serving Jesus. It would be in the yearbooks on, by my picture. When I would sign something, I would often put Luke 12, 48 by it. Unto whom much is given, of him shall much be required. I had a mom and dad who loved me, who read the word of God to me daily, who got me into church every time that they possibly could, every time the doors were open, sent me to Christian school for seven years. I had been given much, so I was accountable to much. We have 168 hours every week to love and serve the Lord and to love and serve others? Are we like the servants who are constantly alert and waiting? Or are we doing our own thing, using the people around us, just not expecting Jesus to hold us to account? Are you ready for Jesus to return? This is really wrapping up the entire chapter so far. It's kind of continuing on in the theme Verses 1 through 12, God sees everything and holds us accountable and rewards those who openly declare our faith in him. Whoever, verse 8, confesses me before men, him shall the Son of Man confess before the angels in heaven. 13 through 21, are you investing in eternity or investing in temporary things that will burn up? Uh, 22 um, through 34, God will take care of you you don't have to worry about tomorrow. And then verse 34, where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. And then 35 and following, Christ is going to hold us to account and he can come back at any moment. Are we ready? Where is our treasure? Where are we storing our treasure? Are we looking to our earthly activities for pleasures? Are we looking to his glory and eternal pleasures with him. To whom much is given, of him shall much be required. As we come to the Lord's table, we come undeserving, but we come gratefully. We come knowing that we fail the Lord constantly, but yet also knowing 
that the Lord forgives. That's why he had to come. It's because all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Jesus' sacrifice for us covers all sin. And my encouragement for us each this morning is to take our sin to the Lord and seek forgiveness. And he promises that he will restore the relationship with him. But I, my encouragement and challenge is also that if you are willing to hold on to your sin and rebelliously say, well, I'm just waiting for that person or I'm waiting for this or that or the other before I obey God in this, then you're kind of saying that Jesus' death isn't accomplishing its purpose. You're living for yourself instead of for him. Let's take a moment and we will kind of consider where our hearts are and then we'll sing in a moment. So examine your hearts before the Lord.